And we are going to get looking at a question that comes to mind. I've been maybe watching too much TV, but uh, I keep hearing about this personal relationship that we are to have. They keep talking about you having a, a personal relationship. That's what you're looking for. You're not looking for religion. You're not looking for... I don't know. I don't even know. But we're looking for a personal relationship is what I'm told. And it brings the question to mind, do we have such a thing? Do I have a personal relationship with him? Should I have a personal relationship with him? Where is this? Well, where is it coming from? And maybe more importantly, does the Bible say something like this? Or does it contain something about that that we should know? And I do keep hearing this in, uh, in you know, whatever, religious circles, people talking about this need to know God in, in the sense of um, being a, a friend, you know. And the question is whether or not that's biblical. Does, does God say this in, in his word? And I think God should have a say, you know. We, we ought to let him tell us what he thinks and listen to what he says in the words that he's given us in the Bible. And that should settle the matter. That should settle every matter. Now, look, with, uh, look with you in the Gospel of John in chapter 6. Let's look at this thing that Jesus said, and I found this when I was trying to see, you know, who knows Jesus and who knew Jesus at the time? And what did he say about coming to know him and coming to be with him? Um, and I think this is actually the most helpful little bit in John 6, something that he said when teaching in the 44th through the 46th verses. Because they were saying, isn't this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say he's come from heaven? And that answer is in the 44th through the 46th verses, at least in part, where he said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. That's himself, of course, Jesus. He has seen the Father. So they were thinking, well, don't we know this, this fella? And don't we know his parents and his family? And, and yes, and there, there is a sense in which they do know him and, and his family. And they, they do know where, you know where he's from and who his brothers and sisters are. But that's just... A little bit. That's a part of the story. That's the, the physical trappings, if you will, of the life of Christ. What he came to do was something much greater than to be one of us, although he was one of us. Uh, he came to do more than that. And as he says in the 44th verse of John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So individuals do come to Jesus. We do approach him, and when we do so, it's because we are drawn by the Father, meaning there's some attractive force there. There's something there that you know, gets our attention, gets our devotion, that draws us to him. What is it that draws the attention to Jesus? What is it that puts our focus on him? Well, it's what he said, I'll raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. And everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So in the, the prophets, in the Old uh, Testament, if you will, in the scriptures of old, the holy people who came before in ancient Israel said that they're all taught by God. How is that? It's from his word, clearly through the Bible. And those, every person who is going to come to him, who is being drawn by God, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
That's what it is to be drawn to Jesus, which is not an unexplained force. It's not an irresistible phenomenon that God decides you're going to believe in Jesus and you feel yourself um, you know, inexplicably drawn to him. That's not real. The Bible doesn't say that. What it says is if you are reading this book, if you are hearing the words of this book, then God is teaching you. And everyone who has heard and learned from God is the one who is coming to Jesus. That's what leads to Jesus is knowing this book. Individuals are drawn in this way. And he even clarifies in the 46th verse, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. And this is uh, you know, a reference, I guess, back to John chapter 1 earlier, he had said that nobody has seen God, only, you know, only the one who came from his side has come to us and explained him to us. This is there in the middle of John chapter 1 when he's explaining how the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. He's the one who has seen the Father. But we have not. So with him to say they've been taught by God, they've learned from the Father, they're coming to Jesus. He's not saying that you've seen the Father, you, you haven't seen him. It was not personal, even though we're individually being drawn, and I guess in some sense I personally am being uh, taught when I'm reading the Scriptures and I'm listening to what God says, then yes, I'm being taught, and nobody else learns for me. I can't learn by osmosis or by proxy. Yeah, okay, fair enough. That's true. But it's not the case that I have laid eyes on God, that I have seen um, this appearance of him, his face, a miracle, anything of this nature. There was no personal uh, relationship, no interpersonal relationship. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, reactions or um, interactions between us. If I'm coming to Jesus, it's because I am hearing these words, and these words are what draw, and these words are what teach, not because I've laid eyes on him. Um, so I think that's, that first one is very important for understanding. Jesus said we are coming to him. We are drawn to him, and it is by the Father, but it's through the teaching. It's not personal, not by sight. And so I wanted to get to uh, thinking about this question about relationships, as people keep talking about relationships so much. There's a heavy emphasis on this in the world, and yes, in the churches too. So does Jesus say anything about that? You know, what I started to wonder, where do I see Jesus commenting on personal relationships? And there are a handful that we're going to look at here, but the summary of these things is that generally our earthly relationships with each other, that would be, you know, our associates, our friends, our co-workers, but also our family members, just whatever human associations, our, our relationships with people are secondary to the faith in God, that nothing comes before God. God is first, and our fidelity to God is first and is primary and governs all the other relationships that we might have. That's the basic gist of what Jesus is saying, and so one example is in Luke 14, you look in Luke 14 with me. I just have a couple of verses. It's the 24th, uh, sorry, 25th and 26th verses of Luke 15, uh, 14. I probably didn't say this right, did I? It's Luke 14, verses 25 and 26. <laughs> All right. Where Jesus said, I'm sorry, where great crowds accompanied him. Jesus is getting a crowd. It says, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned 
and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So, just to be clear, when we say hate, we mean by comparison, as in the love of God comes first. You don't actually hate people and say that that's a Christian thing to do. It's just a way of phrasing this to say that by comparison to my love for God, it's also what people will say that, you know, you're not doing it my way. Or you're not, you know, putting me first. You're putting God before me. That means that you hate me. Why do you hate me? Why do you treat me so hatefully? Uh, not doing what I want, doing what God wants, you know. So that's the meaning there. Not that hatred is at all a value of the Lord or of Christ, other than the hatred of wrongdoing, that we should get away from that and get it out of our lives and be ashamed of it. So just a word of clarification on our translation there. But the first thing I notice here in the 25th verse is that great crowds accompanied him. So he's attracting people, lots of people, large numbers. And this very often is thought to be a goal, an important goal. People think we ought to be aiming for having great crowds, large numbers of people. And it's true, I would love to see large numbers of people be interested in learning about God and in worshiping God. I would love to see that, and I think you would love to see that. But it's not an end in and of itself to have a lot of people. What we are doing is what the Lord did. He turned and said to them, if you come to me, you have to come a certain way. If you don't, put me first. Above father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life, then you cannot be my disciple. So we cannot continue to learn from him, even though if we're taught by the Father, we're drawn to him, on coming to him, if we are not willing to put God the Father first and everything else, literally, second, we can't keep learning. We can't be his disciple anymore. So Jesus demands the priority over every earthly relationship. He's telling us that all of our earthly relationships are secondary to the spiritual one, not saying they are unimportant, just saying God comes first. God comes first, and he has to. We must do what God wants us to do. And sometimes father or mother, wife or children, brothers or sisters do not want us to do that and will not appreciate doing that, and may not want to continue to associate with you because you choose to obey God and to live the Christian life. That is possible. as It certainly does happen and has happened many times before. But we have to continue to put God first. So in the teaching of the Lord, this is the relationship. We have another passage in Matthew 10 that is similar, but it's not identical. So we're going to read it. It's Matthew 10, verses 34 to 37. Do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. People think that Jesus comes to bring peace on earth. And he said, do not think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace. That's what Jesus said about it. But a sword, does that mean he wants us to be at war? No. He's talking about this. I've come, quote, to set a, a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. End quote. This quotation is from the prophet Micah. He's saying there's a teaching in Micah that is what his teaching is like when he said, I have not come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword. That's division. 
Truth is going to make divisions. I don't want it to do that, and I hope you don't want it to do that. It's not good to desire division. It's not good to desire fighting. But the fact is, truth is going to make divisions. There is going to be controversy over truth. And Micah 7, uh, we'll look at this together. If you go to Micah, but... I'm placing that as, uh, you know, this Micah 7, uh, verses 2 through 7. You might parse it a little bit differently, put the beginning earlier or later, the end earlier or later, but I think this is about right. Micah 7, verses 2 through 7, The godly has perished from the earth. There's no one upright among mankind. They all lie in wait for blood. Each hunts the other with a net. Their hands are one on what is evil to do it well. The prince and the judge ask for a bribe. The great man utters the evil desire of his soul. Thus they weave it together. The best of them is like a briar, the most upright of them a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman, of your punishment has come. And now their confusion is at hand. Put no trust in a neighbor. Have no confidence in a friend. Verse 5 said, and I think that's the theme. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your arms. For the son treats the father with contempt. The daughter rises up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. But as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Micah 7 verse 7. This is the theme, I think. Verse 5 and verse 7 lay out that theme. Put no trust in a neighbor. have no confidence in a friend. I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. That's what he means when he said he came to bring a sword. He's referring to Micah 7 and quoting it directly. Why I say this? Because the fact is that sometimes people aren't doing right. And sometimes you come from a family of, of people who don't believe. They don't believe in God. They, they don't claim to be Christians. Other times we come from families who think that they're Christians, but they're not. As Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 and following, not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And many will say to me, did we not do many works in your name? I'll say to them, I never do you. That's Matthew 7, 21 and following. Put no trust in a neighbor, have no confidence in a friend. Look to the Lord. That's what Jesus is quoting here in Matthew 10. And he continues the thought. Of course, I let go of the page. And he continues the thought in Matthew 10, 34 to 37, after quoting from Micah. At the 37th verse, whoever loves father or mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than he loves me is not worthy of me. So this is how you know, you know, earlier we read Luke and he said, if you come to me and do not hate these family members, you cannot be my disciple. This is what we mean. This, that, that idiom is expressing this. If you love them more than you love him, you've got it backwards. You need to love him more than you love them. And if you come to him and love them more, you're not worthy of him. We cannot, you know, we want our family to be saved. We want our family to do right. We want to believe that our relatives who have passed on have a blessed estate in eternity, that they are in heaven, but you cannot change the truth of God and what he says to do. And whether they did that or whether they didn't do that isn't up to me and it's not up to you either. And we can't do anything about it after the fact. We need to know what God says and do it. 
And in Luke chapter 8, we have this too, which is very similar, but not the same, and so that's why we're reading it. But Luke 8, 19 to 21, records for us this little bit where his family, his blood relatives, came while he was teaching. and seemed to summon him to come out to them, which he refused to do. It records, his mother and his brothers came to him, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered those who told him, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. which I'm sure is not what his mother and his brothers wanted to hear. But that's the truth. They're standing outside. They can't get to him because of the crowd. Why is there a crowd? <laughs> what crowd? <laughs> well, because he's teaching He's teaching the gospel. There's something happening here that is of great importance, and people realize that. They know that. They value that, and they have crowded around to hear him, but not his family. They don't think that it's great. They don't think it's important. They don't believe him. So now they want to stand outside and pull rank because they're blood relatives? Not so. Jesus said, no, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So the teaching of the Lord about our family is that we have a different kind of family in the spirit. When we obey the gospel, when we become Christians, we're joining hands with others who, like we did, listened to what God said and obeyed it. And that's the family we now have in God. And that's the thing that is important. Not that these other relationships cease to exist or that they're not important. That's not what we're saying. Don't misunderstand. But that they are secondary. And there is something that's more important. And there is something that is more valuable. And we're not going to show our mother, our brothers, you know, our, our personal relationships, our, our friends, you know, neighbors, coworkers, family, we're not going to show them that God is important by deprioritizing God on their behalf. That's not going to work. They're going to have to see that God is important when we choose to be with God instead of to be with them, if it comes down to it. And that's no different, you know, that's no different when it comes to the churches, you know, people worship in places and they know, well, they've got a lot of things wrong in this place. I'm like, okay, so why are you there? Well, I'm trying to be an influence. I'm like, you know what? If you want to influence them, you leave. That's what you do. Because that's not right. Why are you putting your hand to that? Why are you participating in that? You need to be among those who hear the word of God and do it. That's the right thing. That's the right influence. That's what Jesus said. And so, we have other ones to look at, but we're not going to do it right now. <laughs> um, what we, you know, what we'll do is uh, move on for now in the lesson, and we'll come back. Uh, reveal to you at this time that the next idea that I had was to look at the actual, you know, tangible, personal relationships that Jesus had on earth. We have a record of his family, uh, his brothers, who they are. We have a record of apostles whom he knew, one who is a personal friend, John, um, and one 
you know, even if you look at Paul, who only knew him from a distance, not as well as the rest of the apostles, but basically trying to run, you know, the complete gamut, if you will, from those who are blood relatives, grew up in the same house with him, all the way out to Paul, who was, you know, alive and present in the Jerusalem environs when Jesus was teaching, probably saw and heard him, but was separate from that, didn't believe at that time, you know, came to believe later. We've got the whole, um, you know, spectrum of experiences of those who are very close, very personal to those who merely knew him, knew of him, had seen him in the flesh, you know. I want to look at those in the scriptures together with you and consider what they had to say about that relationship that they had with Jesus when you're looking at personal relationships. But will suffice today, you know, to stop with what Jesus had to say about this to begin with, that we are drawn to him when we are taught by the Father. We are drawn to him uh, when we hear these words. If we come to him and we do not put him first, even above all the earthly personal relationships that we have, then we cannot continue to learn from him. We won't grow. We won't become Christians that way. But he also had a lot to say about deprioritizing, you know, that we have got to love him more than we love our family, that uh, we cannot put our trust in a neighbor. You know, people, people do wrong sometimes. Not all the time, not that you trust nobody. It's just to say, God is the one that we trust in. We're not putting our trust in the flesh. We're not putting our trust in the imaginations of men and the schemes of men. We're putting it in God and what he says in the scriptures. And there are things that are more important than family, the spiritual things. Now, again, we're not saying that having those relationships with your family is unimportant. That's not true. And when you become a Christian, even if your family opposes it, you're still a member of that family to the best of your ability. It shouldn't be up to you to decide that you're going to sever ties with them, not going to have anything to do with them. Like, no, that's not Christian. You want to be an influence. You want to continue to have... Um, you know, an example before them. You want to continue to show them the love of God in the fulfillment of your duties towards them in love, the love that a father should have or the love that a, a son or a daughter should have for their parents. Um, that's not the thing that we're talking about here. What we're saying is that those do not take precedence over God and over spiritual things. There is not a biblical idea that we personally have some kind of a relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, personally. That's not an appropriate thing to do because he is not our buddy, you know, our friend, uh, our fellow passenger on the bus. He was here in the flesh. He did live a life you know, a normal life until about age 30, right? But that's not what he is now. That's not all that he is now. I mean, this is like people wanting Jesus to, you know, they want the, the, they want the little baby Jesus in the manger, not the adult angry Jesus with whips in the temple. But that's the same Jesus, you know? Different things, different situations, I understand. But that's the same Jesus. But everybody wants the baby, not, not, not the, the one who has authority and uses the scriptures and corrects us sometimes. But that's the real Jesus. It's not appropriate for us to treat him any less than an authority. And it's not even possible. We're, we didn't live in the first century we, you know, I, I, you know, as my teenagers, or as I only have one now, my teenager says, back in the 1900s, you know. <laughs> so okay, I did live in a different century, fair enough, but nowhere near the first century. <laughs> 
So we, it's not even possible for me to have known Jesus or to have known people who knew Jesus. And those who did know him, they didn't cling to it after his resurrection. That's what you're going to find when you look at what James said, when you look at what Jude said, when you look at what John said and what Paul said. They did not cling to that relationship after his resurrection because after his resurrection, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has ascended. He's at the right hand of heaven. He deserves our respect. And these who knew him personally abandoned that former personal relationship to adopt the new, the ongoing spiritual kingship of Jesus. He reigns in our lives and he reigned in their lives. And so the reason that I think it's important to ask about this personal relationship, you know, people, like say, you hear a lot about it, gets brought up all the time, outside the churches, inside the churches. And, you know, people say a lot of things that aren't true. Why, you know, why focus on this? Well, I think because it's quite dangerous, actually. And this concept of him being a personal friend or is just a little too chummy. A little, little too much buddy-buddy, because the fact is Jesus is an authority figure, and he reigns, and, and he, he dictates, and he commands, and when he gives commands, we must keep them. We're on the hook to fulfill what God said and what he wrote in Scripture. So I don't want, I, I, I want to respond to anything that is, uh, you know, introducing danger I want to respond to anything that is leading us to do any less than obey. Anything that leads us to get just real comfortable and not snap to it when we understand what the scriptures tell us to do. And I think that's what's happening with those personal relationship people. They're not seeing this for what it is. This is a life and death matter, obedience to the gospel. This is a life and death matter. We have to obey. We have to do what he says. He is the king. He has a right to command. He came in the flesh. He lived a life as we have, and he died a horrible death at our hands for our benefit because he loved us so much. But we didn't know what we were doing then. Now, if you understand who he really is and why, why he really came and why he suffered so, now you repent. Now you realize, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. Now you want to be pleasing and you want to be reconciled with God. And that's what Jesus came for. That's what he died for. And yeah, there's a sense in which that's a relationship, I guess, the relationship that a king has to his subjects, uh, such as it is, which is not a personal one, but is one of obedience, yes. And yet, we do have a Savior who in the flesh suffered as we did, who is tempted or was tempted as we are, although he lived that perfect and sinless life, which we're not going to do. And so we have confidence to draw near to God. Our confidence is not in ourselves, but in Christ who lived this way and died this way so that we could have confidence. His blood washes away sins. His life and his teaching enable us to be pleasing to God in our lives. Today, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, won't you become a Christian? Won't you obey the gospel of Jesus? In Acts chapter 2, when the crowd realized that Jesus was, in fact, the Christ and that they had crucified him, they said, men and brothers, what shall we do about this? And the response in Acts 2, verse 38 from Peter is, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit's gift. The promise is for you and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God will call to himself. Have you been called by God hearing these words of his in the scriptures, realizing that they are speaking to you? 
We have water prepared that you may be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins, as Peter spoke about then, and as has been the case ever since he said that. Actually, he didn't say it. Jesus said it in Matthew 28. 18 through 20, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's the Lord's teaching. Are you subject to it? If so, we have made preparation that we might be able to help you to obey him. There's water prepared. Are you a Christian already, but haven't been living right, haven't been following the priorities as Jesus has laid them out for us today. Repent and pray God for forgiveness, as the example was said in Acts 8 with Simon, that God may forgive the intent, the thought and intent of your heart. We'll pray with you and for you too as Christians because none of us is above temptation. We all need help from time to time. Maybe I know something about what you're going through. Maybe I can offer some help or assistance. If you need the prayers of the saints, if you need to obey the gospel, let your need in the spirit be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.